Amen. All right, let's look here at John chapter number 7, beginning in verse number 14. The Bible reads, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never read, never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his own glory that sent him, or he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil, who goeth about to kill thee? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Then some of then some of them of Jerusalem, I'm sorry, then said some of them of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? Verse number 26. But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? I'm going to be preaching this evening on the importance of being a Christian that speaks or preaches the Word of God boldly. The importance about preaching or speaking the Word of God boldly. Now, I want you to notice how this began when I started reading here in, in John chapter number 7, verse number 14. It said this, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So I want you to imagine, if you will, or, or, or understand the scenario that the Bible is painting here. Jesus Christ, in the midst of the feast, goes up into the temple. Now, does it sound like the temple is full or empty? There are masses of people here, and Jesus walks into the temple, and He just begins teaching the people. He starts teaching them the Word of God. I want you to look there in verse number 15. What is the, the immediate reaction? It says this, And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters? Having never learned, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Uh, that's also a good, this is a side point, but that's a good uh, passage or verse to prove that Jesus Christ is sinless there. He says there's no, no unrighteousness in him. He's speaking about himself. Verse number 19 says, Did not Moses give you the law? And he says this, notice, And yet none of you keepeth the law. Now does that sound positive or negative? Extremely negative, right? And he goes in the midst of the temple, and does it seem like he's fearful? Not even slightly. He goes into the, into the middle of the temple, he's standing there with everyone. In the midst of the feast, there's masses standing there, and he just gets all of the attention and starts teaching and preaching the Word of God to them. And he's not only just teaching positive things, because most of what the Word of God contains is not positive. Most of it is negative. And most of the time when, you know, uh, things that we need to hear, well, they often will be negative. That's why the Word of God is negative, because we're sinners, so we need to be corrected continually. So he's going in there and he's preaching the Word of God, and he's correcting them. And then he says in verse number 20, The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? So notice the extreme opposition. So this isn't just light attacks. They say to him, thou hast a devil. I mean, that's extreme. That is an extreme accusation to say that you're devil possessed. Well, he's just standing here preaching. I mean, you've got to you know, put yourself into the shoes of, of someone that is maybe a bystander, someone that's witnessing this. Then it says this, Jesus answered and said to them, I have done one work. And ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto, you the, gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have made a man every whit, or completely that saying, whole on the Sabbath day? 
Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So what is Jesus uh, explaining to them uh, what sin that they are committing here? What are they being? They're being hypocrites. And he's just openly you know, uh, uh, teaching and preaching the Word of God and expositing to them and you know, uh, rebuking them for their hypocrisy in the middle of the temple here. Look at verse number 26. Notice what it says here. We'll read verse 25 and 26. It says, Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? So they are already out to kill him. There's already people speaking. Jesus, of course, became aware of this and didn't go at a certain time. He waited because he was aware that they were trying to imprison him. They were trying to catch him in his words. And they were trying to even kill, them, kill him. And then it says in verse 26, This is what the people standing by, this is how they view Jesus. It says, but lo, he speaketh boldly. But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? So when someone stood by and they watched Jesus Christ walk into the temple and start preaching, he's standing in the midst of those that are trying to kill him, those that are trying to imprison him. And a, a, a bystander looks at Jesus and it says, these are the people that are trying to kill him. And he's in here preaching to them. And, he, and they say, lo, he speaketh boldly. That is how a bystander viewed the way in which the Lord Jesus Christ preached the word of God. When he looked at Jesus standing there preaching, the way that they summarized it and how they, they perceived it was that he was preaching or he was speaking boldly. In this scenario, this is a, of course an extreme scenario, He's preaching before and two people, a very negative message that, uh, or two people that are uh, attempting to kill him or desire to kill him. Now, most likely you're not going to find yourself in a situation like that. You never know, but most likely you are not. So this is, of course, a very extreme situation. But us as Christians, we need to preach and teach the Word of God boldly. We need to not be ashamed of the Word of God. We need to not be embarrassed of the Word of God. It doesn't matter where we are, what scenario we're in, and who we are speaking to. We need to always preach the Word of God boldly and confidently. One thing that's interesting about this passage, and this is one of the great points that I want to pound home with you tonight on why we should preach it boldly, is because we are not only preaching our words, we are preaching God's words. I want you to look at John chapter number 7 there. Look at what it says in the very beginning, verse number 15. It says, And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Notice what Jesus responds with. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Notice there that Jesus emphasized that he's not just making up new doctrine. That's his point. Of course, he's speaking you know, uh, in a cryptic way about his own humanity. But notice that he, he describes and he explains very clearly that he's not just making up his own doctrine. This isn't just his own distinct doctrine, right, as a man. He is actually preaching what? He's preaching the Word of God. And that is why Jesus could preach boldly. Obviously, any words that Jesus speaks are bold, right? And the Word of God, he could preach it boldly. But the same thing goes for us. We can stand up and we can preach the Word of God boldly because it's not just our words. It is the Word of the Lord. I want you to turn to Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13. So Jesus being our ultimate example, of course we can look at him as the supreme example and we can see that when he stood up and preached, he wasn't timid, he wasn't shy, he wasn't embarrassed, and he wasn't ashamed. He preached the Word of God confidently and he preached the Word of God boldly. He even stood in the midst of people that wanted to kill him and he still didn't stutter, he just preached the Word of God. He wasn't afraid of what may happen to him or what the consequences would be. He preached and he spoke the Word of God boldly anyways. The apostles did the exact same thing. Look at Acts chapter number 13 verse number 46. The Bible says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, 
Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So notice here when it's speaking about Paul and Barnabas, it says that they waxed bold or they grew bold. And what do they end up doing? They end up giving negative news again, saying, since you have rejected the Word of God and you've considered yourselves unworthy, that this isn't something for you, you don't want the Word of God, what we're going to do is we're going to turn from you and we're not going to preach the Word of God to you any longer. We're going to go to the Gentiles. So what are they doing? They're delivering a negative message. They're delivering and they're preaching a message a negative message of what did they do? Were they scared? Were they timid? No, they waxed bold, it says, that they grew bold. They were confident in what they were uh, preaching and speaking. Go back to Acts chapter number 9. So we're going to be a little out of order here. Acts chapter number 9, verse number 27. We'll see the same thing. This is a pattern on how the apostles preached the word of God. They preached it boldly. It says this in verse number 27, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. This is speaking about Paul. And that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas, when he brought Paul, he actually witnessed Paul preaching in Damascus. And how did he perceive the way in which Paul preached the word of God? He says that he preached the word of God boldly. He preached it confidently. Look at verse number 28. And he was with him, with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Verse number 29. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. And then it says, but they went about to slay him. So notice Paul is, found himself in a very similar situation. He is preaching the word of God boldly. First he did it at Damascus, then he does here, even to the point where the Grecians are going about to slay him, but he's still not afraid. He's still preaching the word of God. He's still waxing bold. Go to Acts chapter number 14. We'll see this again. Acts chapter number 14. Look at verse number 3. <clears throat> It says this, Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of His grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So notice, over and over and over again, we're given a description on how Paul is preaching, and it says that he's preaching boldly. He's preaching confidently. He's preaching, he's, he's unashamed, and even to the point when people are trying to kill him, they go about to slay him, he's still preaching the, the word of God boldly. So you see this repeatedly. The disciples of Christ are going out. We could look all throughout the book of Acts and we, we can very clearly see them preaching boldly. We don't even have to you know, have the Bible tell us that. It's very obvious that they're confident, they're bold when they're preaching the Word of God all throughout the stories that are recorded. And we use them as our example. Of course, we saw the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ preaching the Word of God and He was bold. But not only that, now we see the disciples, we see the apostles. Now, the apostles are just men, just like you and I. There is no difference between you and Paul the Apostle. There is no difference between you and Peter. They were just used of God. That's the only difference. God chose them out and used them. They were vessels that God you know, uh, made meet for His use. And, of course, He gave them you know, great power through the Holy Spirit. But they were just normal men. They were not divine. They had no deity. They were just normal human beings just like you. So when we look at the boldness that they had, you can also excel to that same boldness. You can also get to the point where you have the same confidence and the same boldness in your preaching as all of the disciples and as all the apostles did. I want to begin, I'm going to be giving you three different scenarios in your life where you need to preach the Word of God boldly. That's what I'm going to be doing in this sermon. But before we do that quickly, I want to give you two basic definitions of the word bold or boldness. Go to Philippians chapter number one. I'm going to show you what it is and I'm going to show you what it is not. Philippians chapter number one. <clears throat> Philippians chapter number 1. I'm going to begin with what it is not. So look at Philippians chapter number 1. Look at verse number 20. The Bible says this, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. I want you to notice that. In nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life 
or by death. Now I want you to notice that he's contrasting the two things. And these two things cannot coexist. They are polar opposites of one another. The opposite of being bold is being ashamed. That's why Paul makes the statement that in nothing I shall be ashamed but, saying rather than being ashamed, he says, but that with all boldness, and then he says, as always, and so forth and so forth. So notice what the opposite of boldness is or being bold. What is it? It's being ashamed. So if someone is not bold when they are preaching the word of God, they ultimately, to some degree, are ashamed. Or what's another word for that? Embarrassed. That's a word that we would commonly use today. So the opposite or what being bold is not is being ashamed. If someone is not bold, that person is ashamed. All right, in, in Philippians, uh, we actually have the, in verse number 14, we have what it is. We are also told what it is, and this is going to begin uh, with my first point as well. Look there at verse number 14, Philippians chapter number 1, verse number 14, it says this, And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds. Remember that statement before that said waxing bold? Waxing confident by my bonds are much more, watch this, bold to speak the word, again, watch this, without fear. So we get a very big or vast idea here from a, a, a couple of different angles of what the word bold means. Number one, we saw that it was the opposite. Being bold is the opposite of being ashamed. Not only that, here we can see that waxing bold or people waxed bold, or I'm sorry, waxed confident is the same as being bold. Those two things are being used synonymous. It says that they waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold. So they're going confident, but then they are also what? Bold. The word confident just means to be bold. Not only that, a person that is bold is not afraid. If you look, if you continue to read, it says this, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, remember in that scenario where we saw Jesus preaching, was that a scenario that the majority of people would be afraid in? Of course, if they thought that they were going to die, most people would be afraid. But the opposite of that was what Jesus was doing. And that was him preaching boldly. And they were surprised by this. Like, how are you walking in here with no fear when they seek to kill you and preaching the word of God boldly? So they were impressed or they were surprised that he was not afraid, but rather he was bold. So we can see, number one, what it means to be bold. It means to be confident. What, does, what is the opposite of being bold? It is to be ashamed and then it is also to be afraid or to be fearful. The very first scenario that you're going to find yourself in, in preaching the word of God, is preaching the gospel. And when we preach the gospel, we need to be bold when we are preaching the gospel, when we are going soul winning. Again, look at Philippians chapter number 1, verse number 14, and notice what they are preaching here, what is going on. It says in verse 14, And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Look at verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy. And then it goes on and so forth and so forth. So what is it talking about specifically? What are they preaching? They're preaching Christ. They are preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of Christ. And what does it say the way in which they are preaching? What is it? They are preaching it boldly. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. It's actually just back in your Bible. It should be only be one page, maybe even on the same page. Ephesians chapter number 6. Look at verse number 19. This is Paul. It says this, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So notice there that Paul is requesting those in Ephesus, the Christians in Ephesus, to pray for him that he may have, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. When we go forth and we're preaching the word of God, we're preaching specifically the gospel, we should not be afraid when we go to the door. We should be opening our, my, our mouth boldly. Notice what it says in verse number 20. It says, For which I am an ambassador in bonds. Now watch this. That therein I may speak boldly 
Watch closely. As I ought to speak. Do you know the way in which you ought to speak when you preach the gospel? Boldly. You ought to speak boldly. You should not be speaking any other way when you're preaching the gospel to someone. You should be speaking boldly. And what does it mean to preach boldly? It means to preach confidently. It means to be not ashamed. It needs to be not afraid. That's what it means. To not be afraid. Now we can all uh, you know, relate to this to some degree. Like I said, to in some way or another. Especially maybe if you haven't went soul winning for a while for whatever reason. And you go and knock on your first door. How do you feel? As confident as can possibly be? No. Right? Even sometimes if you haven't went soul winning for just a couple of weeks for whatever the reason is. And you go and you knock on the door. That first door, how do you feel a little bit? A little bit nervous. Maybe a little bit embarrassed. Now, we may be you know, reluctant to say the word ashamed, but it's the same thing. You're embarrassed or ashamed about what the person's going to think when they open the door sometimes, aren't you? You're embarrassed or ashamed when you're walking down the street and maybe people are, will look at you. Everyone gets in the flesh from time to time and they're thinking, you know, what, I wonder what those people are thinking about me. You know, I can definitely relate to this to times in my life for sure where you're, people are walking down the street or you're walking down the street and you find yourself in a scenario where you're preaching the gospel, you're out preaching the gospel and you can become embarrassed or you can become ashamed by the specific, you know, situation that you're in. You know what that is? That's the opposite of boldness. And that's not how you ought to preach. When you go to the, the door of someone, you should open your mouth boldly and you should not be ashamed of the word of God. You should not be afraid. You should not fear what could happen. You should open your mouth boldly and preach confidently the word of God. And there are many reasons why we should preach and we, we, we you know, should be preaching boldly. I want you to go to Romans chapter number 1. I'll tell you one of those reasons right here. Romans chapter number 1. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 1. Look at verse number 16. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 16. <clears throat> the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, what is the opposite of being ashamed? It's being bold. So what's he saying? He's bold. When it comes to what he's talking about right now. The gospel of Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. When you stop and you think about what you are taking to their door. You have no reason to be ashamed. And you have no reason to be embarrassed. And you have no reason to be afraid. You are bringing something to their door that will save them from, a, from an eternal torment from fire. What, what in the world do you have to be afraid of? Or what in the world do you have to be embarrassed or ashamed about? When you are carrying the actual living word of God, the breath of life underneath your arm, and you're afraid or you're ashamed or you're embarrassed coming to someone's door. When you have the word of God with you and you have it in your heart and you're going to preach the word of God to someone and the gospel, you should understand that that is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it. There's nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing to be embarrassed of. You are taking to their door... The, the very words of the Creator, which, is, which contains the message of salvation. You are an ambassador, like, like uh, Paul talked about, he's an ambassador in bonds. You are an ambassador. You are sent on behalf of the Creator of the universe. Direct commandments from Him to go to that person's door, to go to all doors. What in the world should we have to be embarrassed of or ashamed of? Nothing. We are the last people that should be ashamed. You know who should be ashamed are those that are going door to door and preaching a message that you have to keep the commandments. That's embarrassing. That's something that's shameful. I can't imagine, you know, even, you know, going to someone's door and trying to preach that. I would be embarrassed or I would be ashamed. You know why? You know why we shouldn't be? Because we're preaching the truth. Because we're going and we're preaching the power of God and salvation and it's the gospel of grace. That you're saved by grace through faith and not of works. Can you imagine how embarrassing it would be to go to someone's door and try to explain to them that you're, they're going to get to heaven by being a good person? That would be hard to be confident, wouldn't it? That would be hard to be bold going to someone's door and explaining to them that, you know, like a, like a Jehovah's Witness... That, you know, there's, there's this man, he's, a, he's completely a man just like you, and he died on a stake. You know, not a cross, he died on a stake, and he was dead for three days and three nights. And, you know, he didn't literally raise from the, from the grave, not in that same body. You know, he borrowed a body and he was given another body. What a mess! 
What a joke. That's something to be embarrassed about. We have the unadulterated Word of God, the perfect, preserved, pure Word of God. I have nothing to be ashamed about. I have nothing to be embarrassed about. We should go to people's doors and we should be confident and we should be bold and we should not be afraid. We need to understand the power that we are carrying with us and it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the message of salvation, the whole purpose of mankind. God came down. He himself came down and was born on this earth as a baby. He lived on this earth for 33 years, roughly. And he died on the cross because he loves you. And after three days and three nights, he, ra he raised or rose himself from the grave. That is the message of salvation. That is a powerful message. You have nothing to be ashamed about. No, we should not be ashamed when we go out preaching the Word of God. It is actually the way in which you ought to speak, according to Paul. It's the way in which we ought to speak the Word of God. Acts chapter number 28, verse number 31 says this, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things <clears throat> which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So notice that. With all confidence, no man forbidding him. I want you to notice a pattern here where in which people are, are, are in situations where they're disputing and they're fighting and they're arguing like Jesus in the temple, like the apostles all throughout the book of Acts. And they're preaching the word of God and they're bold and there are people there that want to kill them. But most of the time, especially we see this in the book of Acts, most of the time what ends up happening? They're spared. You notice that? People that are afraid to go out and preach to God, what are they worried about? Sometimes they're afraid to maybe go into the ghettos or they're afraid maybe they're going to be attacked or the, maybe it's a rough area they don't want to go out and preach. But oftentimes you notice in the, in the Word of God you'll see Jesus in the midst of people and He'll go through the middle of them and get away from them while they're trying to kill Him. He'll go to the temple and He'll stand in the middle and He's preaching to those that want to lay hands on him that want to kill him. But what happens? He's delivered, isn't he? Do you notice what it said about Paul? It said he was preaching and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. And then it says this, no man forbidding him. So notice how God will provide you or put you in a situation. He'll put a hedge around you oftentimes when you go and you do what he asks you to do. And you go and you preach with boldness. He'll protect you. And He'll keep you safe when you're there and you're preaching boldly. But the person that's afraid, the person that's scared, you know, we don't have a scenario of that. We don't have the person that's going out and preaching the Word of God and he's afraid. Our example is that we're supposed to go forth and preach the Word of God boldly. I want you to go with me to Titus chapter number 2, verse number 15. Titus chapter number 2, verse number 15. So this is the second point, point number 2. <clears throat> and it's just teaching people the Word of God boldly. The first point was preaching the gospel boldly. The second point is teaching. Teaching with boldness and, and teaching with authority. We need to be teaching the Word of God with authority. I want you to see that here. If you're teaching with authority, you're of course teaching with boldness. Look at Titus chapter number 2. Look at, we'll read verse 14 and 15. It says this, Who gave himself for us that he, might, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. V verse 15, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. And then it says, let no man despise thee. What's he saying? Don't be afraid. Even when people look down on you, even when people, you, you should not let these people despise you and look down on you. You need to take the position of authority. He's of course speaking to Titus, but right now I'm focusing on speaking with boldness or speaking with authority. Now this is a scenario that we're going to find ourselves in very often. Just where you are having to teach other people or speak to other people. Now being, you know, a Christian and being a conservative Christian or like a fundamentalist type Christian, you probably have a lot of family members that are not Christian or maybe a lot of family members that are Christian but they're not maybe as conservative as you are. And they view you as, you know, the die hard or died in the wool, the, you know, the, like I said, fundamentalist, right? In their eyes, that's a bad thing. They think of a Muslim when they think of fundamentalist, right? And when, you know, oftentimes they may not want to speak to you about things. They may, you know, not want to associate with you very much. But sometimes when you're at a gathering, and you may or may not have had this happen to you, I know I can attest that I've had this happen a few different times. Maybe if you're at a family gathering, or maybe not even at a family gathering, maybe something goes wrong in that particular person's life, and they have a question about something they've been thinking about about the Bible, you know what they'll do? 
they'll come and they'll ask you. So they may know, they may want to stay away from you and think that, you know, you know uh, you're weird and things like that. And, you know, you know, all, you know they're, I don't even, can't even grasp their concept or their perception. But they think you're this weirdo, radical fundamentalist. And they don't want to necessarily yoke up with you. But when they have problems and they have troubles and they've tried the philosophies of the world and they've shown in their own, you know, uh, experience that they don't work, what do they end up doing? They end up coming to you and having a question for you. And a lot of times in those situations, in those scenarios, they're hard questions or they're questions that can be controversial, aren't they? Maybe questions about living in fornication or adultery or things like that where it's not hard that the answer's hard. It's a hard answer for them. It can be a hard answer for them to swallow, a hard answer for them to receive oftentimes. Why? Because oftentimes they're coming to you because they're in, a, in between you know, a, a rock and a hard place. And they, they already know that the answer probably isn't going to be positive. So even when we find ourselves in these situations, you know what you need to do? You need to speak the Word of God boldly. You need to preach the Word of God boldly. Even when the person that you're speaking with probably isn't going to receive it. You know what you need to do? You need to preach the Word of God boldly. You know, men, when you find yourself at work or you're out in the day, you know, and, and, and you're working somewhere, and maybe someone is asking you, one of your fellow employees, one of your coworkers is asking you about the gospel or asking you about the Word of God, and you begin to teach them or, or speak to them about the Word of God, answering their questions, you should not be ashamed of the Word of God just because you're at work. You should not be ashamed of these things. Obviously, you shouldn't be burning up company time doing this, right? You know, if you find an opportunity while at work, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're in this situation and he starts asking or she starts asking you questions, whatever it may be, you need to teach them the Word of God with boldness. You need to not be ashamed of the Word of God. You need to confidently confidently tell them what the Word of God says and what the Word of God teaches on any subject. Oftentimes, it's controversial subjects. You know, that's the great thing is that it's the Word of the Lord. That's why we can be bold. That's why the apostles were so bold. Because you can stand there, you can open up the Word of God, and you can say, Thus saith the Lord. Not thus saith Tyler, thus saith the Lord. Not thus saith Rick or anybody else, it's thus saith the Lord. This is God's Word. Therefore, I can have confidence in it. I cannot be ashamed. I have nothing to be ashamed of because I know it's the truth. You know, maybe a scenario where it doesn't have to be family. It doesn't have to be work. Maybe it's a scenario where your neighbor wants to speak to you. Maybe one of the ladies may have their neighbor come to them and they have questions about it. You shouldn't be afraid of the Word of God. You shouldn't be afraid to give them an answer or ashamed of what the answer is. It's the Word of the Lord. You need to be bold and confident when you read the Word of the Lord. You know, you know Jesus wasn't walking around and thinking, man, I hope that they don't ask me about Leviticus 20.13. You know, I don't want to have to give that one to them, you know, or whatever it may be. He's not afraid of, of God's Word. He's not afraid of any angle of the Word of the Lord, right? He loved God's Word. You know, he obviously is God's Word in the flesh. And he's walking around and he'll preach it, you know, unashamedly. <clears throat> and that's the way that we need to be. We need to be not ashamed of God's word and we need to preach it confidently and not being afraid. Acts chapter number 4 verse number 13 says this, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So notice there that a couple of things that they noticed about Peter and John it says they perceived they were unlearned and ignorant and then it said that they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus but what did they see it says that they saw the boldness of Peter and John and then of course and they saw that they were unlearned and ignorant men and then they took knowledge of them why that they had been with Jesus so where did they learn this boldness from where did they acquire this boldness they acquired it from the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they acquired it from Jesus. And we saw that in John 7. Well, how did Jesus preach the Word of God? You know, Peter, James, and John and all his disciples stood around him while he preached in that manner for three and a half years. Well, they followed him around while they, and they saw and witnessed him not being afraid, walking in the midst of people that wanted to kill him and slay him, standing right in the middle and then just unashamedly, without fear, preaching the Word of God. They 
saw him being asked questions by others and maybe controversial questions that nobody in that audience wanted to answer and he unashamedly gave them the answer from the word of the Lord. So you know what happened? Because of that, they grew in boldness while they were with Jesus. Now, I truly and in every way believe that the word was with God and the word was God. I believe that you know, it is the scriptures that testify. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. I believe that Jesus was literally the Word of God made flesh. The literal, I, don't, I shouldn't even have to say that, but the literal Word of God made flesh. And the same boldness that Peter and James and John witnessed Jesus preaching and, and, and with, we can find that in the Word of God. <clears throat> and the Word of God is bold. When you read the words of the Lord, you read down through here, it has extreme authority. It has a massive amount of authority. That's why oftentimes cults try to use the Word of God because it has power. The words that are contained in this book have a massive amount of power and they just have authority. And that being because they come from the soul of the creator of the universe. They are His words. So they contain intrinsically power and authority. Have you ever had the, you know, have you ever sat around your house maybe and, and you're not reading to yourself, you're reading out loud? And you can just feel the power and the authority of God's Word while you're reading. I'll do that all the time. I'm just reading, you know, the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah's prophesying. And I can just tell, like, when it's coming off my tongue, like, this has so much power in it. There's so much authority in the Word of God. It's the same thing as boldness. You can see those preachers while they are boldly preaching the Word of God. When Isaiah preached the Word of the Lord and he preached it boldly. That same boldness that Peter, James, and John acquired from following Jesus around, you can acquire by spending time with Jesus, the Word of God. You can get that same boldness by reading the Word of God. And the people that read the Word of God more, they are more likely to be bold. The people that read the Word of God less, they're going to be less bold. They're going to have less authority. The man that reads his Bible all the time and then stands up behind the pulpit, he's reading it daily all the time, he's memorizing Scripture, he's got tons of the Word of God just in his heart and in his mind. When he stands up behind the pulpit, he's going to be much more authoritative, he's going to be much more bold, he's going to preach the, the Word of God, you know, not being ashamed, as opposed to the man who's never reading the Word of God, who doesn't know the Word of God that well. He's going to get up. He's going to stammer. He's going to stutter. He's not going to have as much confidence in the Word of God. It's the same thing. You can tell whether someone is very familiar with the Word of God or not. You can tell. You can even tell sometimes that there's something off with preachers when you're listening to preachers preach. And maybe possibly that's because they're not spending enough time in the Word of God. Obviously, most of the preachers in the United States aren't spending enough time in the Word of God. But you get, you acquire boldness by being with Jesus. Do you know a way in which you can acquire boldness? You yourself, you are going to be, do you think you're going to be more confident or less confident when going soul winning if you're not reading your Bible? You're going to be less confident. You're going to be less bold. But if you're spending time in the Word of God, reading the Bible every day, much time in the Word of God, you are, of course, going to go to that door with much more boldness. You're going to preach the Word of God with much more boldness. Because these are authoritative words. They're powerful words. They can give you boldness. So that's one way in which we can acquire boldness. The same way in which uh, Peter and James and John did. I want you to go to uh, Micah chapter number 3, verse number 7. We'll see this here in Micah chapter number three, 3. And this is thirdly, I'm going to go to the third point now. And this is uh, the scenario of actually preaching the Word of God behind the pulpit. Being a preacher of the Word of God behind the pulpit. <clears throat> It's Micah chapter number 3. <clears throat> I want you to look at me at verse number 7. I want you to notice and, and keep everything in mind of the definition of boldness that we've learned thus far. It says this in verse number 7. Then shall the seers, it's like a prophet, obviously that's a preacher of God's word. Then shall the seers be ashamed and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips for there is no answer of God. So they're ashamed, they're confounded. This is the opposite of boldness. Verse number 8, it says this, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might 
to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So notice there that it says this. It says, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. What did Jesus say the words were that he spake? He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Those words were life that he spoke. This right here is how you get filled with the Spirit of God. The way that you get filled with the Spirit of the Lord is by reading the Word of the Lord you know, as much as you possibly can. Every day, spending time in the Word of the Lord, you are going to be filled with the Spirit of God. He says this, but truly I am full of power. Now power is, is of course the boldness. It's the might. It's the confidence. It's the exact opposite of being ashamed. It's the exact opposite of being confounded. He says, and of judgment and of might. And what to, to do what? To declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So again, that is uh, preaching a negative message. And it says that he is filled with power and of judgment by the Spirit of God. When a preacher stands up to preach behind the pulpit, he should preach with boldness. You should never get up behind the pulpit and preach a message that you're not bold about. You should always be preaching. If it's the Word of God, you should be bold. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with God's words. And you should preach it confidently. You should preach it unashamedly. And you should preach it with boldness. Now, anyone, of course, can stand up behind the pulpit and preach. You don't have to, you know, uh, be a pastor. You don't have to even want to be a pastor. You don't have to be in an office in the church or even desire an office in the church. Anyone can stand up and have the opportunity of, of preaching the Word of God. And if you were to happen to have that opportunity, any of the men, you should do so boldly. You should do so confidently, even in the preaching class. You should stand up behind the Word of God and not be ashamed, not be scared. And keep in mind that you are preaching the Word of God. Now, if you were standing up here and having to just make up your own thing, just your own words, and you were all relying on your own spirit and your own philosophy and all of your own you know, uh, 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 ideas, well, then you would have something to be ashamed about. Then you would probably say something stupid. You'd probably get up here and kind of fumble around and not have you know, something that good. But I'm thankful that when I stand up and I you know, have to write a sermon and I get to preach you know, a, a message to you, that I preach the Word of God, that I have something that is solid, that I have something that I can have you know, my confidence in, and I can be bold in the Lord and be bold in the Word of God. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. I'm going to read you from Acts chapter 19, verse number 8. Acts chapter 19, verse number 8 says, And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Acts chapter number 18 verse number 26 says this, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now you notice there in Acts 19 again, what, when does it mention that they were preaching boldly? It mentions it when they were disputing, when there was, there was opposition, right? That is when, obviously, it is even more necessary to preach and teach the Word of God boldly. I want you to look at me at 2 Timothy chapter number 4, the famous words that are given to the preacher. It says in uh, verse 1 first, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Now, sometimes we read over these charges, right? Charging is like a commandment, but it's you're charging someone to do something. Notice what he says, I charge thee before God. So he's saying, I'm commanding you or charging you by the power of God. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? That's pretty authoritative. I, I'm, he says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Then he says this in verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So there we have the three words. Preach the word that is given unto the preacher here. This would be Timothy, of course. He's telling him, he's, that he's charging him, commanding him to preach the word of God. Then he goes forward and gives him some more information. Gives him further details. He says, preach the word, be instant. That means be ready at any time. Be instant in season and out of season. In season is when it's popular. 
Out of season is when it is not popular. You need to be willing to preach someone the Word of God when it's popular and when it's not popular. You need to preach the Word of God when somebody wants to hear it and when they don't want to hear it. It is the Word of the Lord and you need to be bold when you do so. Notice the, how, how part of the preaching is negative. It says reprove, rebuke, and then it says this. This is positive. Exhort. That's like to uplift, to get people to do more. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You know what he's telling Timothy? He's telling Timothy to preach the Word of God even when they do not endure sound doctrine. That's what he's teaching. That's what he's saying. That's when it's out of season. He's saying the time is going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You know what he's saying? Even when they don't want to hear it, preach the Word. And how should you preach? You should preach boldly. You should preach authoritatively. Even when someone doesn't want to listen. If someone asks you, your, you, know, you know, what an answer is to a Bible question, you should tell them and not be ashamed of it. You should tell them boldly and confidently and not be scared. Like he tells Jeremiah, you know, to not be afraid of their faces. Saying you can tell when people are angry when they're looking at you and it's saying, don't be afraid of them. Even if they're mad at you, even if they don't like what you're saying, if it is the Word of God, who cares? Who gives a rip? Preach it anyways if it's the Word of the Lord. If, it, if it's found in this book, you should preach it. And you shouldn't care about people's feelings. You shouldn't care about whether or not it's hurting someone or things like that as far as their emotions. Because yeah, ultimately the Word of God fixes problems in people's lives. Ultimately the Word of God is going to correct issues that you have, even if it does hurt in the beginning. It's just like the spanking. You know, there's the, you know, you got you to, gotta, right there in the beginning, you got to nip it in the bud. And it may be painful right when you do it. And, you know, when you, when you give them the message of the Lord, when you give them the rebuke or the reproof. But you know what? You'll save them a lot of heartache down the road. Just like the children, when you have to spank them now, you'll save them a life of, you know, without misery and pain and drunkenness and whatever sins that you spare your children from by, uh, you know, disciplining them. So it's the same thing with preaching. You need to understand that the ultimate purpose is that good would come out of it. The ultimate purpose is that the Word of the Lord would go forth. It's not going to come back void. It's going to do something. It's going to be planted in their heart. It has power. It'll be there. And hopefully, you know, uh, you know, that seed can find good ground and they will respond correctly. But you know what? Even if they don't, you know what you need to do as a preacher? You need to preach the Word of God. You need to preach it boldly, confidently, unashamedly. You need to preach it without fear. All right, so I gave you three scenarios that you may find yourself in in which you should preach the Word of God boldly. Number one was door-to-door -door soul winning. When you go door-to-door, -door, never go to a door where you're afraid. Never go to a door when you're embarrassed or ashamed. You need to fight that. You need to try to be bold when you go to the door. Think about all the reasons why we should be bold. So you need to be bold when preaching door to door, when, when you're out soul winning. Number two, just in casual conversation in life. You have people asking you questions, family members, people at work, your next door neighbor, whoever it may be. You know, you're out, you know, uh, uh, out in public somewhere and someone asks you a question about the word of the Lord. Answer them boldly. Do not be afraid. Not be a, don't be scared, even if it's something controversial. Whatever the subject is, boldly. Because it's not your doctrine. It's the Lord's, right? It's not something you made up. It's, we may subscribe to it, but it's God's word. It's the Lord's word. So... We need to be boldly in conversation. Number three, when someone is preaching to a congregation, they need to stand up and preach boldly. They need to not be afraid of the faces. They need to not be afraid of those that are sitting in the pews. And whether or not questioning, you know, am I going to make him mad or am I going to make her mad or whatever it may be. If you ever have the opportunity to preach the Word of God, you need to, obviously the purpose isn't to get up here and just offend everybody that you can. Just knock each person one week, I'm getting this Bob's family, the next week it's the next Bob's family, and then I'll move over to Martinez. That's not the purpose. Right? I'm not out to offend people, but I'm just going to make sure I cover all of the Word of God. I'm not going to hold back anything like Paul says. I'm going to preach all of it. And when I preach whatever subject that it may be, even if it you know, may you know, uh, 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 hurt someone's feeling or feelings or whatever, if you have the opportunity, you need to preach the Word of God boldly. You need to preach the Word of God boldly in all situations. So, um, I'm going to give you one tip about also real quick uh, to, a, to a person that is, if you are lacking boldness, one thing that you should do 
And we can see this throughout the New Testament. You should pray for boldness. Acts chapter 4 verse 29 says this, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Let's talk about people threatening them, wanting to harm them. Behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. So notice the apostles of the disciples who preached boldly prayed for boldness. So when you look at the Word of God and you see that there are pe there's people that are preaching boldly and they're praying for boldness, do you know something that might be smart for you to try if you lack boldness? Maybe pray for boldness. Pray for boldness. We read this earlier also in Ephesians 6, verse 18 and 19. It says this, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. And for me, saying, also pray for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So notice that Paul is requesting them to pray for him, that he could have boldness when he preached the word of God. Of course, he's asking for them to pray for him for this. Obviously, he prays for this for himself also. So he prays for boldness. He asks other people to pray for boldness for him. And how does the Bible repeatedly say he preached? In what way? Boldly. He preached confidently. He waxed bold. He preached the Word of God confidently. That's how we should be. And if you lack boldness, you need to pray for boldness, according to the Bible. That's what people that preach boldly in the Bible did. Even those that were bold, they were praying for boldness in their lives. So if you are nervous or you're, you, you, you feel like you get embarrassed or ashamed sometimes when you're going to the door and you're going to knock on doors, before you go out, pray for boldness. Pray that the Word of God, uh, you know, uh, that you wouldn't be ashamed of the Word of God, you wouldn't be embarrassed of the Word of God, because you have no reason to be embarrassed of the Word of God. That's the last thing I'm going to do. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should be bold when preaching the Word of God. Number one, uh, we can preach boldly because we have the truth. I touched on this. We can preach boldly because we have the truth. You know, if we were you know, preaching a lie or if we, what we had here was false, we'd have no reason to be bold. But we have the truth so we can be bold. Number two, we can preach boldly because the Word of God is powerful. Because the Word of God has power. It is a message that is full of power. We don't, we're not carrying around a weak message. We're carrying around a powerful message. And then thirdly, this is the last point. We can preach boldly because we are doing what Christ commanded us to do. When we're out and we're knocking on doors and we're soul winning, you are commanded to be there. So you can be there and you can be knocking on that door and not be afraid and you can think to yourself, I'm supposed to be here. I'm not going to go sit in my car and go home. God wants me to be here. That can also give you a sense of protection. God is going to protect you. So you can go out and you see over and over again when these people are preaching the Word of God boldly, it tells you about Paul, no man forbidding him. So God gave him a hedge of protect protection, put him in a special situation and gave him special treatment, if you will, because he was preaching the Word of God boldly and was not afraid and was not scared. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you that it's a message full of power and authority. We ask you that you would be with us, dear Lord, that you would fill us, fill us with your spirit so that we could preach with power and might and judgment and to be bold, not to be afraid. Uh, the last thing we need is, is more people that are ashamed of the word of God in the world, dear Lord. Help us to stand up and to, to be uh, 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 you know, bold and confident in the words that we speak and in the word of the Lord. And we love you so much and be with us and bless our church. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.